Hey, it's time for voiceover body shop. We're back after a couple of weeks with lots of weird stuff going on here. <laughs> Surgery and Memorial Day and all these other things that go on out here. Our guest tonight is the wonderful Debbie Irwin. Say hello, Deb. Hello, Deb. There you go. <laughs> See, I follow directions. <laughs> it's, well, and being able to take directions, very important in this business. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to be talking about medical narration, which is a big market because there is a lot of medical stuff going on out there. And if you want to learn a little bit more about it, now's a great hour to hang out with us and learn more about it and how to do it. And if you have any questions... All you got to do is put them in whatever chat room you happen to be in, whether you're on Facebook Live or whether you're on uh, YouTube Live or if you're one of the growing crowd that's in LinkedIn Live. I don't know what they call it now. But anyway, throw the questions in there. Jeff Holman is hiding in there somewhere, and he will relay those questions to us in the next segment so you can ask Deb those questions as well. Are we all ready, everybody? Let's okay. do this. All right, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop right now. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, the home of Harlan Hogan's signature products. Source Elements, the folks who bring you Source Connect. VOHeroes.com. Become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. VoiceActor.com. Your voiceover website ready in minutes. VoiceOver Extra. Your daily resource for voiceover success. And by World Voices, the industry association of freelance voice talent. And now, here's your hosts, Dan and George. Well, hello there. If you're wondering, I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. B. S. Yes. Thank you very much. Anyway, well, we're glad to be back after uh, a couple of weeks of hiatus. And apparently the show, the, the last Tech Talk was only on YouTube because Facebook didn't want to upload it for some reason. <laughs> Meta is a freaking meta mess. It is. Like it a is. real, like a steaming pile of garbage yes, fire, yeah. dumpster, diaper yeah. stuff. So hopefully it'll all work this week and it's we'll get good. it right. Yeah. yeah I'm and glad it, we got multiple platforms. That's all yeah. I can say. Yeah. So I had neck surgery a couple of weeks ago. And, yeah. uh, you know, you I'm not going to show every. Opener? Yeah, essentially, you know, and then, then sew it back up and fix my spine and all those things. And now I can wow. I can walk without tripping over my own feet. It was a very strange thing. Science. Yeah. yeah. Science. I'm glad anyway, you're recovering nicely. Yeah, I'm you know, I'm not gonna show everybody my scar like I've been That's doing okay. all weekend. So um <laughs> We will use our imagination. Yeah, it's it yeah. Marcy's talking my wife is talking about putting bolts in my head and you know, it's yeah. like you're looking like Frankenstein. Yeah. Anyway, speaking of medical stuff, uh we have a great guest tonight. Uh Debbie Irwin has been spending years of her life lending her voice to everything from medical explainer videos for patients and medical professionals to pharmaceutical marketing to medical legal recordings and more uh are what make her the expert in the medical narration industry. So let's welcome to the show I guess for the first time as an actual guest Debbie Irwin. Uh, hey. hey. Hi. You... Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. I think we've we've interviewed you at at FAFCON and at a couple of conferences and stuff, but this is the first time you're actually here sharing your expertise with us. So we really appreciate that. If if my booth were big enough, I would curtsy right now and okay. say thank you. <laughs> not, not really necessary. So how long how long you been doing uh, voiceover? I guess just twenty you know, years. Oh, oh, just twenty years. Yeah, that's, yeah, just that's twenty more years. Than most. That's cause for a celebration right there. Yeah. How did how did you get into how did you find your way into this marvelous business? You know, circuitously, like like many folks, I really didn't know anything about voiceover. I had a background in theater and had come to New York back in 1980 to pursue that dream of being a stage actress. And after I struggled for a couple of years, uh, I decided, okay, enough of this. I'm ready for a real job. So I started working at the Guggenheim Museum, 
doing PR and special events. And if you know anything about the nonprofit world, especially in New York, if you're not independently wealthy or married to someone who is, then uh, you just can't afford to, you, you can't afford to keep that job. So I was ready for uh, a serious job that paid serious money. And I went to Wall Street, became a stockbroker. And did that for a number of years, had a successful career there, then left Wall Street for Sesame Street when I started making babies and was lucky enough to be a full-time mom. <laughs> and somewhere along the line, my mom planted the seed of, what are you going to do when you go back? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I happened to find a course in one of these, you know, NYU School of Continuing Education books. And I was like, this looks interesting. So I took the class and within the first five minutes standing up and with a script in my hand, I was like, Eureka, <laughs> I found it. So uh, that's the Reader's Digest version of, of how I ended up here. Yeah. And so uh, I like to yeah. I like to say I'm living my dream that I came to New York for. I just didn't know it was going to look like this. It usually doesn't work that way anyway. But <laughs> uh, and you're originally from Chicago, right? Chicago. Yeah. South Side. Uh, all right. You're from South Side of Chicago. Oh, oh yeah. Wow. That's yeah. That that you know, that's not You know I love to dance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, not, that explains that too. So how long how did you break into doing you know, a lot of medical narration and how long have you been doing it? I don't think I I don't think I really broke into it. I think it it found me. And when I talk to my med medical students, the, the people who coach with me, I say, you know, it's really important to to go for the low hanging fruit. Why make it difficult? Maybe you 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 know have a dream to do animation, but if people are hiring you to do IVR or e learning, go you know do that. Don't fight it. You know, enjoy the success of that genre and then work towards something more specific. So because of certain quality, natural don't qualities, do don't fight it around my voice. I was just hearing an echo. Yeah. Um, That'd be my fault. I was going to say it's George's fault. <laughs> <laughs> I was hearing, don't fight it. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. I was like, is it, that my alter it, ego reminding it. me? Don't fight it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so because of certain qualities around my voice, it sort of naturally sounds, and I, I feel a little, uh, I feel a little funny when I say this because it sounds presumptuous, but it is a speck, intelligent, <laughs> authoritative, <laughs> um, uh, warm, um, worldly, sophisticated. So because of these natural qualities that are in my voice, I was getting hired for this kind of work that required somebody who sounded intelligent and could make sense of the content well enough to, um, to communicate it in a way that expressed my understanding of it, you know, and my understanding is not deep, it's broad you know i do try and understand the content um and we can get into that later but because sure. sometimes it's very difficult to understand the content <laughs> yeah well and and you know medical is it i mean it's huge i mean i've done a lot of it too i've done a lot of pharma uh and and it it's not getting smaller it's getting bigger um and, and continues to be so but it's a very interesting reading of course every every project's a little bit different uh, but then again, some of them just seem to sound the same all the time. Uh, so I, I, I guess I could ask, can anyone do this kind of stuff? Uh, with a pen and a paper, is anyone an author? <laughs> <laughs> Good. But just, just because everybody can doesn't mean everybody should. Yeah. And, and I would ask another question, which is, does everybody want to do it? because it's challenging and there are certain things about medical narration that you don't find in let's say commercials for instance it's long form the terminology is can be very technical it can be tongue twisting it can be difficult to understand you have to have stamina in order to read you know a long script let's say you know a, a isi for an hour or whatever so not everybody thinks that that's a fun job. Uh, I remember years ago, I had one a session for an ISI and it was, 
I don't know, maybe 10 minutes long, something like that. And really, at the, you know, by law, they had to have it at the end of their video, but they didn't want it to be read conversationally. They wanted it to be read as fast as possible. Now, I had done my homework to prepare because I always do before I get into the booth, but I had no idea they were going to ask me to read it fast. So <laughs> that was a challenge. Like to... disclaimer fast or like well, disclaimer not, fast? Not, or... not disclaimer fast. No, not disclaimer fast, but, but faster than, f faster than, too fast. <laughs> <That's> faster <laughs> than like comfortable conversational yeah. speech, I guess. Even, you know, it just, they were like, pick up the pace, pick up the pace. So it's very technical. There are all kinds of, you know, percentages and dates and how many people in this study and that study and technical words. So it was a, it was, it was a challenge. If I hadn't prepared, I would have, you know, been horrible. But as it was, you know, I certainly hadn't prepared like that. Um, because that had never happened before where somebody asked me to read it quickly. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, do, do you have to have a background in science or medicine to be a good medical narrator? No, absolutely not. You don't. But it helps and uh, not always in the ways that somebody thinks. Um, I am the daughter of a scientist. My dad was an entomologist. And so, you know, we had insects in vials in the refrigerator growing up and um you know so science was part of my my uh my childhood um and certainly having familiarity in the field is is helpful but the field is so vast to your point that you know there's terminology in 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 you know cardiology that you're not going to hear in gynecology etc cetera, etc cetera. so in all the different subsect section sections sectors uh you may be really proficient there but not necessarily in you know in content that you're not familiar with i, I got to ask a totally out of the blue question but that's just i just i'm a color guy i'm, I'm the color guy here right so <laughs> Is it is a man going to get booked to do gynecological no. narration? Mm -mm. No, right? Mm -mm. Yeah, just because. Oh, here's yeah. the thing: we always uh, we're we're always storytelling, and yeah. we're always thinking about not only who am I, but who am I talking to? Exactly. Yeah. If you're a woman, do you want to hear man telling you what to do with your body? Hell no, right? right. No. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost insensitive. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not to say there aren't male gynecologists and that women yeah. don't go to them, et cetera. Right. However, um, however. POV, uh, the POV of the, of yeah. the, of the listener, of the audience, right. right. Who yeah. are you, who are, who are you talking to and how do they want to be spoken to? Are they right. elderly? Are they young? Are they your peers? Are they, uh, you know, above you? Are they, you know, there are all these different variables that have an effect on how you tell the story that you're that you're telling, because mm -hmm. when we're talking to our spouse or our kid or our in-laws, we speak differently. <laughs> Absolutely. If you're just joining us, our guest is Debbie Irwin, and we're talking about medical narration. Yeah, we don't we just talk about general stuff on this show a lot, but something really specific like medical narration, which is as we said, very, very large. If you've got a question about this, all you got to do is write it down in the chat room, wherever it is you're watching our show right now, and we will get to that question in just a little bit, so stay tuned for that. So I guess a follow-up to that would be, like, when you're doing these types of reads, uh, who are you talking to? I mean, are you talking to other doctors? Are you talking to patients? Are you talking to just the general public? I would imagine... It's yes, yes, and yes. Okay, I figured mm -hmm. it would be specified in the in the specs on that. But rarely all three at the same time, I would imagine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here's you know here's the thing when I when I talk about medical narration, I say it's a huge umbrella, under which you have commercials and explainers and e-learning and IVR and Voice of God and mm. MOA uh, mechanism of action and mechanism of disease animations. ISI, the important safety information. So you have all these wow. different subsectors that are areas that people work in without 
you know, outside of the medical sphere. So in terms of commercials, it could be a commercial for a senior living center. It could be a commercial for a hospital. It could be a commercial for Ocrevus. I'm on <laughs> my voice is on uh, the currently running Ocrevus and everybody tells me they hear it all the time, you know, giving the, the fair balance information. So there's a lot of work there and that's not complicated and it's not um, uh, challenging. You're talking to one person and, um, you know, it's, a, it's more intimate and you're either talking about, you know, you're... You're generally not talking to doctors in a commercial because that's not how they're reached. They're right. reached privately through other kinds of of media, um, explainer videos or um, these Pretty medical much. animations and scientific animations because they need that they have a, a well, pharma salespeople have a toolkit with all these different assets. And sometimes it's, let's say, uh, an e-learning uh, video that's a conversation between a patient and a doctor. So that's more appropriate for them. And, you know, in a commercial, again, you're, you know, you're, you're targeting either, you know, people to go to a certain hospital or, um, you know, providing resources or M Medicaid and Medicare, right? All that stuff is all over. Right, You're, we hear it all over. Are you probably more likely to book commercials for pharmaceuticals if you've been doing medical narration for a long time? Well, I don't know that you're necessarily m more likely to, but if you are, if you are proficient in in reading the more challenging medical text, then yes, you're more likely to, to be hired for that specific role in a commercial, which mm. is the important safety information, which is yep. the fair balance, you know, do not take this with, you know, do not take this with milk and the, the serious side effects could be blah, 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 Don't blah, blah. Don't take this drug if you happen to be right. a, uh, allergic right. to this drug. Exactly, kind of exactly. But yeah. for, you know, for the commercials that are, um, you know, at, at, St. Joseph's, uh, you know, healthcare, we, we care about everybody in the neighborhood, not just the blah, 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 blah. Right. And right, you don't need right. to have a background in, you know, right. medical, uh, right. or be a strong medical narrator in order to do that. Well, you need to be a storyteller and be compassionate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So to your, yeah. just, I want to finish answering sure. your earlier question, Dan, about, yeah. um, does it help to have a background in science? So, yes, as I was saying before, it helps that you are, you know, familiar and comfortable with many of the many of these, you know, complicated terms. But where it's really helpful is when it comes time to market yourself. So some of my students, you know, I've had an anesthesiologist, I've had nurses, pharmacists, science writers, et cetera. So at the point at which you're ready to hang, hang your shingle, you know, open for business, and I'm a stickler on when that time is, because you need to be able to do any and all of those different kinds of medical narration, in particular, and especially the complicated stuff, in order to call yourself a medical narrator and a pro. Right. Because I've heard plenty of stories from uh, from clients who just, you know, so frustrated that people represent themselves as that. Anyhow, I'm getting off track. Um, so once you're ready to really put yourself out there and say, yes, this is what I can do when it's time to start knocking on people's doors via LinkedIn, let's say when you have a background as an anesthesiologist, you know that lingo, you know those people, you can join a hundred groups on LinkedIn. I don't know that you'll find a hundred anesthesiology groups, but you will find many. And you join the group and you start to converse with them and you have things in common with them. So you can add to the conversation because you know what they're talking about. I usually suggest being a fly on the wall initially, just to hear and see what people are you know, talking about. But at any point when you feel like you've got something to add, add it. And that way people start to get to know you and you're, you're presenting yourself as someone who is also familiar with 
anesthesiology. The fact that you're a voice actor, they'll discover when they click on your name to find out more about you. It's secondary, right? And as I tell my students, look, if, you know, when, uh, you know, if the job has to do with, with anesthesiology um, and I'm knocking on the door and my student who was one is knocking on the door, they're going to open it a lot faster for him than they are for me because they share something in common with him. Right. So, so where is the work? I mean, you were saying there's so many different pieces of this. I mean, pharma and, you know, pharma to doctors, pharma to the general public. You've got, you know, doctors to doctors. I mean, we right. can discuss some of the weird jobs we've had in a little bit because uh, I have a doozy. Um, <laughs> anyway, so where, where, how do you find the work for all these different types of genres? Well, let's talk about what kind of work it is. It's, yeah. um, you know, many times when you're talking to somebody who doesn't know about voiceover, when you start to list all the different kinds of voiceover they are, there are, they'll be like, oh, wow, yeah, I never really considered that that was voiceover. And the same thing um, happens in here. So I'm just going to rattle off a bunch of different kinds of projects. Okay. There are aftercare videos, Right. You maybe you were sent home I, with one after. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I no, I well, I was sent a few of those. Yeah, like. <laughs> okay. Somebody voiced those. Somebody shot them and voiced them, right? And it could have been you, Dan. Um, there are award ceremonies. You know, hospitals have benefits, annual benefits, and they've got their their um, anthem video. Uh, showing what they've accomplished over the course of the year, and that needs a narrator. There are t there's tons of e-learning, continuing medical education for uh, all kinds of HCPs, healthcare professionals. There are uh, funding pitches. So I was hired to narrate a video for Johns Hopkins University. They were pitching to get funding for some research around um, blood testing. And they put a lot of money into creating this video and I got to voice it and they won a $50 million grant. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, um, that's just one other little kind of thing. People probably never even thought about that. And then there are in-office videos, right? Um, when you're in the hospital or in your doctor's office, it, you know, they don't want to have to say the same thing to 100 right. people over and over. So they'll create a video of content that's relevant to everybody so that they can consume it on their own. Uh, there's student education. There's what to expect. There's medical and surgical videos, anatomical, cellular. I mean, there's research videos. There's just a tremendous amount of work happening yeah. globally. Once again, we're talking with Debbie Irwin about medical narration, and uh, I'm sure that brings up a lot of questions for everybody. Yeah, you were talking about, you know, in-office stuff. When you're, when you're sitting there in, an, in, a, in a doctor's office, there's, now they have, you know, a video screen in there, and they're running some medical network or something specific to that particular uh, area that the, the doctor you're seeing is about. Like, you know, it's like you go to the cardiologist, Here's how you take care of your heart. You know, right. And then they'll be interviewing a doctor or something. But somebody's got to narrate that stuff. So uh, where can you find copy for these types of things so you can try to practice it and see if you can do this kind of stuff? Well, uh, you can transliterate a commercial, right? Uh, but my favorite place to tell people where to find copy is in their medicine cabinets. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go to the drugstore and, um, you know, pick up my, in this case, okay, it's Zolpidem. Every now and again, I need a little help sleeping. So I like to have that little pill just in case. Or if I'm traveling to Europe, I want the help to go down. And so most of the time, you know, we just take this and we toss it and we go into the bag and get, you know, get our goodies. But actually do not toss this document. This is invaluable. There is so much wonderful information here. And this is ISI. This is important safety information that you'll be asked to read. So just hit up your medicine cabinet, your ibuprofen, 
it, I, I can barely read it. I need a magnifying glass. And it says, peel back here. And then underneath here are all the warnings and symptoms and indications and all the rest of that stuff. Or even if you have a, a pet, right? And you have to get some uh, medication for your pet. Um, you know, there's instructions in here. Yeah, read <laughs> Open <those>. it up. <laughs> right. The ingredients. It's for Zymox. Advanced formula octic HC 1%. Uh, warnings and cautions, uses, contraindications, right? Whether right. it's a dog or a human. So there's lots and lots of wonderful information uh, right here. Even if you're still testing yourself for COVID, which I did the other day, negative. Um, oh, good. That, the, that packet of information, you know, that tells you what to do, what the steps are, that's medical right. e-learning right there. First, Absolutely. you do this. This, these are the pieces in the in the box. You have this, that, and the other thing. You know, first yeah. you unscrew the tap, then you do the this, and then you do the that. So, it's not just ISI information that uh, that you can have easy access to. Yeah. Uh, where, where do you find buyers for this? I know I remember I worked for companies that contract out to the pharmaceutical companies and I assume the pharmaceutical companies do it themselves as well. How do you, and how do you find them? I mean, the names are all pretty well known, but. Yeah, it's, it's hard to work directly with J and J or, you know, any of the, any of the big pharma companies. Um, because they are so huge and they either have their own ad agencies or and or in-house uh, production companies or they're dealing with agents, um, you know, to provide them with with talent. So on the on the P2Ps, you'll oftentimes see um, projects that come through for, you know, Medicare or hospitals, et cetera. Um, and. You can also do your Google research to find production companies and, you know, those science communication studios, let's say, or medical device manufacturers, um, you know, government agencies also produce a tremendous amount of content that has to be um, narrated. Universities and academic institutes. I've developed a relationship with uh, a couple of universities and for their graduate students' um, master's thesis projects, I have narrated many of them. So they are learning how to be animators. They're getting their master's degree in this. And so for their thesis, they have to create a project and part of making a project perfect and the best it can be is to have a professional um, voice artist. So I see that as an opportunity to also teach these young people who are coming into the field about working with a voice artist and what kind of information is helpful for us to have. Right. So, um, you know, so I can hopefully send some people out there who uh, think about voice and sound and music earlier in the process. Right, right. Once again, we're talking with Debbie Irwin. We're talking about medical narration. It's it's a big, long subject. I mean, if you're, you're teaching it and there's so many different things there. But again, if you've got a question, throw it in one of the chat rooms you might be hiding in right now and let us know what you want to know. And Deb will be able to answer that. Uh, all right. This is this is we'll get to some interesting stuff here. Like <laughs> the hardest part of this business of doing medical narration is pronouncing some of the names. There's if if you're good at Latin or some of these <laughs> other things, it, it helps, I imagine. But you've got a couple of words here that I you know, two of them I have no problem with. The last one I don't think anybody can do, although I'm sure you've probably practiced it a million times. Uh, like, uh, I wonder if, if, if Sue can put some of these up there as we're saying them. Like the first one here is sphenopalatine ganglioneuralgia. How'd I do with that one? Yeah, pretty good. Sphenopalatine ganglioneuralgia. Yeah. Which I, yeah. Is, is, Any is, guesses <laughs> as to what the heck that is? Well, I already know. Let's see if anybody else knows that. You know what that one is, George? Heck No. <laughs> no, Sphenopalatine sure ganglioneuralgia. It's a very serious condition. You should know it, George. Everybody should know it. 
Is it one of those things that a really stupid long name and it's a really simple common uh Yeah, sort thing. of. <laughs> but Couldn't it's it it's an ice cream headache. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> which is more which that's... is more acute than a migraine headache, apparently. Yeah, yeah. just not as long and lasting. But more and... brief. Right. <laughs> yeah. I uh, didn't know I... that. Wow. All right. This one, the, the second one here is my personal favorite, because when anyone asks me about medical narration, like, well, could I do medical? Well, you have to say something like ankylosing spondylitis without thinking about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there it is. Ankylosing spondylitis. I knew that one, you know, and I had to do it because it was, an, ankylosing spondylitis is a, um, uh, a not plaque psoriasis, but it's a it's an, an inflammation thing with, uh, with due to your. Uh, the spine and system. joints, right. Right, right. And, and and there's lots of different treatments for it. NSAIDs and non you know, what's your non steroidal whatever it is. See, I've done a lot of this stuff. I know where all this goes, but <laughs> but let's look at the last one here because I have no idea what it is. Uh no, not not spalatine ganglion neuralgia, but the last one we had there, Sue. Um uh, let me that see if really, I can really, really, really long really, one. Really, really long one. It's all right. Uh, she's going to put it up here and then we're all going to say it together. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, then and then we're going to go to a break and take your questions. It's pneumomono microscopic silicovo clenanosis. Okay. Go for it. We need to do a little, uh, you know, a little. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Pneumono ultra, pneumono ultra microscopic silico volcanoconiosis. Boy, so you have is... a special skill at looking at that very, very long word and knowing kind of mentally where to divide. No, it no, I need help. Smaller chunks, or I, I need help. I use the dictionary all the time. There are medical dictionaries that I refer to, but and it, it looks it looks completely phonetic. It's a matter of not tripping it's a really long long word but it's really just a bunch of words right because medical terminology is based in germanic language germans love to string a bunch of freaking words into one <laughs> new word and it's like if you can subdivide that mentally right you can break it down but when you right. look at it as at a whole as a whole it's like letters right yeah. and 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 what is this stuff what is pneumo mono black lung disease ah oh. miners oh. asthma right yeah why don't they just call it that? No, they've got to <laughs> come up with that name. Anyway, once again, we're talking with Deb Irwin, and we're talking about medical narration. If you've got a question, throw it in the chat room right now because we're going to get to it in just a little bit. But right now we're going to take a quick break and listen to some of the people who support our show, and we'll be right back with Debbie Irwin here on VoiceOver Body Shop. So don't go away. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on the VoiceOver Body Shop. Have you noticed the specific demands of clients regarding our home VO studios? Are they at a professional level to record for broadcast? And what does that mean? To me, it means it doesn't sound bad. I've seen several now demanding cardioid condenser microphones. Some are great, and cheap ones not so great. So how do you choose? It's like standing in the checkout line at the supermarket deciding which candy or mints you want to buy. So which is right for you? Make it easy on yourself and get the Harlan Hogan Signature Series VO1A, the first and only mic designed for voiceover performers by a voiceover performer. The VO1A faithfully captures deep tones without sounding bassy and has a silky smooth top end that's never harsh. A perfect sound palette for both male and female voiceover performers. Get the complete kit with mic cable and shock mount now. Go to voiceoveressentials.com where you'll see all their great products made just for us voiceover people. Hey, it's that time of the show where we get to thank the sponsors, Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect and Source Nexus, and a bunch of other tools that help engineers connect to talent and work collaboratively remotely all around the world. And uh, they've been doing this for a real long time. And that's one of the reasons why you may have heard of it by now. And it's also why you probably should be quite adept at using this tool, even if you don't have any clients using it quite yet. Um, it has a process to set up and, and learn to use. 
It is not something that is one click and go because it's an application and it's also a bit of an integration with your studio equipment and your network. And you need to know how all of that stuff works. The good news is if you sign up for a subscription, which I highly recommend, they will do it for you. They will, you can book a session with them and they will handle the initial tech setup for you and walk you through the process, which I think is money well spent. Yes, it's true. You sign up, you're paying for a subscription, but you're getting the support and it's worth it. I recommend it. I know many times in the past I've said, just get your free trial, get a demo. And that might be fine for some of you who are much more technical, have a higher aptitude for learning new tech and jumping through a lot of hoops to get things to work. However, if you feel like this is going to make your career to have the technology and you really want that extra level of help, sign up, get a subscription, and have them walk you through it. It's really worth it. You'll feel confident in your studio when you've gone through this. And if you do the extra mile of certification, which you can also opt to do is get certified, you're telling your studio clients, the ones that you work with, that you know what you're doing and you know they know you have a great sounding studio. Anyway, Source Elements is a great software. Get familiar, get certified, and feel like a pro right now. Head over to source-elements.com and get started. Now, back to you. Well, hey there, heroes. It's David H. Lawrence, the 17th of VO Heroes, and I had a chance recently to talk to Amy Jo Berman. Now, who is Amy Jo Berman? She's somebody who can help you with your career. Uh, if you visit the URL below, you'll see it. Amy Jo Berman is uh, the former head of casting at HBO. So she sits on the opposite side of the table when you're doing your auditions, whether it's on camera or voiceover, and she has a lot to say about things like AI and synthetic voices and getting paid for auditions that people have been talking about. Self-tapes at home, which we've been doing in the world of voiceover for like, what, centuries now? This link will take you to a place where you can register for her free webinar where you can ask any questions you want about making your auditions better. And your auditions are the one thing that you have control over that can increase your bookability. So visit voheroes.com slash Berman. That's voheroes.com slash Berman. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Widom. VOBS.TV. And we are back with Debbie Irwin. We're talking about medical narration. Now, one of the things that I wanted to challenge you with was, what's the weirdest medical narration job you've had? I gave you a couple of days to think about this. <laughs> what, what what did you come up with? I it, it's lame. I mean, it <clears throat> that that really tough ISI one, right? Which I where I had no clue that they were going to ask me to to do it at, you know, speed 45 instead of 33. Um times when you know the word their comp you know the the name of a drug and people in the same company don't agree on how it's supposed to be pronounced which is kind of funny uh and you know in a situation like that you do it every which way they ask and then you let them duke it out later after yeah. the session cover your bases <laughs> right um and then i have one it, it's kind of funny that came to mind it wasn't a medical it was for a a uh it was for a perfume, and this was years ago. Uh, I was in a studio session, and I tend to move a fair amount when I'm when I'm working, even when I'm not working. And I was in this adorable jumper, and for you know what a jumper is, right, folks? You know, you're wearing mm -hmm. stockings, you have a shirt, and then it's like a dress skirt kind of thing. Over, well, this adorable jumper was lined with some kind of satiny material. And every time I moved, it was. <laughs> so I had to take my dress off in order to get the job done. Well, <laughs> luckily, even though there was a mirror there, <laughs> luckily, uh, the mirror was like just to here. So, you know, there was nothing they were seeing, but I had to disrobe to uh, to get the job done. Hmm. 
take that out of context. If yeah. You will. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, I, I've had. Not fully, just yeah, partially. Yeah. Now, in the medical stuff, I've had two really weird ones. One was some doctor doing a lecture and nobody could understand him because his accent was so bad. So they hired me to be his voice on this thing. And it was like, wow. OK, I can't even remember what the subject matter was. But that was weird. But the fu- the weirdest one and probably the most uncomfortable one was some doctor who was selling a product and showing people how to use it to diagnose ED, which involved needles and a number of other things. And the video was very graphic. And and it's like, but this and I'm like, why? Why don't just have the guy do it himself? His voice is fine. No, no, no. We want somebody <laughs> professional to do it. And I'm like. <laughs> And I'm watching this video and I'm going. <laughs> so, yeah. See, I told you I'd come up with a good one. But that's <laughs> and that's just one out of a million, you know, that we've, we've all done those types of things. Got a the video is still like stuck in my mind. Can't unsee it. No, you can't. Yeah. You can't. You can't. Oh anyway. My gosh. <laughs> Once again, if, if, if you've got a question for, for Debbie Irwin about medical narration, throw it in the chat room right now. We still have time for a couple here. But let's get to these. George, why don't you get the one from Patricia Andrea? I will. Thank you. Um, hi, Patricia. Thanks for writing in from YouTube. I have a degree in radiography. And when I worked at a legal office for many years, and or she did, or then, because I can't read. <laughs> you can read it on screen and correct my terrible <laughs> comprehension of the English language. Um, where can I look to get medical or legal narration and in Spanish, too? Well, you gave us a little bit of ideas, I think. Well, first of all, are you able to, you know, the fundamentals, do you do you have a, <laughs> an excellent space to record in? Do you know how to record yourself? Do you know how to edit? You know, there are these fundamentals that have to be in place in order for you to then take the next step. The next step is uh, training, is learning how, getting familiar with with the content, right? So the fact that you're familiar with radiology is great, but that does that it doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to tell a story. That doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to act. In the case of Dan, that he needed to act calm. (laughs) <laughs> when he was narrating that, he wasn't feeling calm, but he needed to act calm and professional, even though he was, you know, coming screaming and, you know, his, his skin was was whatever. I was laughing more than anything else. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the good, news, the good, good, good thing about Patricia is she's a fan and watched our show for a long time and works with Dan on her studio. So she's got a great place to record. But like you said, it is a form of acting. Absolutely. I mean, no matter, every kind of voiceover is storytelling. So you have to be comfortable with with the format, right? And know what to expect. Um, so different, you know, when I, when I approach a script, I approach it from like three different doors. The first door is the genre. What do we know in general about the genre? If it's... Um, if it's e-learning, we know that it's going to be sort of more professional, a little more buttoned up. Uh, it's going to be instructive. There are going to be, um, you know, very detailed things that you're being told to do in sequential steps. If it's an explainer, you know that as a genre, they're light and friendly and and easygoing and very conversational. And if it's ISI, you know that it's, you know, really serious and um, you know, you have to get through these complicated terms and the complicated text in a way that sounds like you know exactly what you're talking about. So that's the first doorway, the genre. What can we, what do we know about the genre in general? And then there's the structure. You take a look at that script and how it's structured. If it's a commercial, it's structured, you know, um, problem, solution, uh, you know, yay, everything's going to be okay again. If it's, e-learning, you know, that's, you know, we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what you're going to learn. Then we get into the learning and then we talk about what you learned. (laughs) And that's that structure. When it comes to important safety information, when you look at these, at these documents, you know, you'll see and become familiar with the format of them. Um, you know, there's indications. What is this used for? Um, you know, contraindications. Um, you know, 
et cetera, et cetera. So you become familiar with the structure. And then the third doorway into a script is by the content, right? What are, what's the story that you're telling and what's the subtext and who are you telling the story and who are you telling the story to? So all of these components are really important. And assuming that you have all of that kind of training, (laughs) then, then you're ready to start to put it, put yourself out there and find work. I think that was the crux of the question, which I did a terrible job of reading. (laughs) <laughs> which which says, where can I look to get medical or legal narration? And I think she means work. She didn't put the word work at the end, but I think that's what she meant. And you mentioned earlier that play, pay-to-play sites are a common place to look for that stuff. Mm-hmm. Is that mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and also production companies, right? And again, what what I suggest is being a fish in a different pool of water where you are the only voice actor right Mm. so i I use a metaphor that you know when when we have a project there there are a series of actors of people who are the players right in the project and i say that we're all in the same show we're just not on the stage at the same time so i've made it my business to get to know the other players in the show right the writers the animators, the illustrators, the editors, um, the producers. I'm a member of Swiney, which is Science Writers in New York, right? Mm. And I'm the only voice actor there. (laughs) Why am I there? Well, I tell them, chances are I've voiced some of the things that you've written. It makes sense. The more I understand about the entire process, the more helpful I can be. Um, She she needs to go find her Swiney. Find your swiney. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I left mine in, at home. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Jeff Holman asks, great question. Is medical narration sourced through agents like yes. the big pharma companies? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, and? And? <laughs> I mean, not, not all work comes through agents, um, yeah. you know, and not all. Uh, I, I don't know the big agencies well enough to know if some of them are the go-to for certain genres. Like recently somebody told me that Atlas is the go-to for in-show documentary narration. And I don't know if that's accurate or not, but in hearing that it makes me think, okay, so maybe there are, you know, agencies that are more prone to get certain kinds of work. I don't know of any that's, just does medical or specializes in medical. Um, But I talk when I, if I go knocking on a door of a production studio, you know, in the States or in the U S production studio, or even a talent agency uh, in, in Europe, I say, this is my expertise. And that immediately makes me different from everybody else. I'm not just a Jane of all trades. Um, This is what I, and I also take a look at who else is on their roster to see do they have voices that are like mine or do I bring something different? Yeah. Uh, AJB voice actor on YouTube says, Hey Debbie, I'm on Okravis. Can you save progressive multifocal leuco and synopolophily? <laughs> encephalopathy. And yes. Encephalopathy. Progressive multifocal leuco encephalopathy. I think yeah. I just said it. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Was I that you what you that. had to say, AJB? <laughs> <Okay>. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Right. Justin Tr- Ramos says, yeah. uh, Hey, did Debbie mention their mic of choice? Is that the shotgun on screen? Is that it is a shotgun use? on Tell screen. Tell us a little more about your actual studio. Studio Bricks, the voiceover version. Um, I know now they're making the, the, the pads out of recycled blue jean material or something like that. There you go, right there. Uh, I, this is my home inside my home. And I love it here. I also use it as a storage area for my lipstick because I love wearing lipstick. And, oh, I thought, those, I thought those were pens. And they're lipstick. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> this, this is lipstick. And over here are my lemon glycerin swap sticks, Ooh. which I adore. Your mouth de-clicking. For mouth uh, yeah. de-clicking, if I'm too wet, if I'm too dry, I, you know, I open this up and I swab, swab, swab. And then I stick it in. I have a, a pencil 
uh, holder that's like a broom. So I just stick it right in there and then I just continue to use it. Now over here where you can't see, I have my pens and pencils and uh, chapstick. Yeah. Did the guys at Studio Bricks think about this when they were designing all this stuff? I don't think so, but it's I don't think so, but <laughs> pretty fascinating. Really good, idea, good use of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tony Hoover, a question or comment here. Some people who use uh, Google Translate, they type the word, then hit the microphone icon and hear an AI voice speak the word. Is using Google Translate a good idea? More importantly, is it accurate? Well, I often triangulate um, resources because there's a British pronunciation of a word and there's an American pronunciation of that same word. Um, you can be you you can be given a reference to how to pronounce something in a video, and that person is speaks English with a very heavy non-English accent and it can be hard to decipher what it is that they're saying and also just figure out if that's really the correct pronunciation or if that's just a reflection of their accent and their understanding of it. So I will go to the company oftentimes to ask how it's pronounced. Generally the person who answers the phone <laughs> knows it pretty well because he or she or they are saying it um, all the time. But I like to use Webster's Medical Dictionary a lot, and I also use the Cambridge Dictionary um, to, you know, to get the British and English um, pronunciations. And I check with my clients. Yeah, that's always a good one. It's like, <laughs> yeah, they're the ones that make it. Perhaps they know how to pronounce it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it always amazes me how 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 weird some of these pronunciations is, are, and how do they come up with some of these drug names? Yeah, you know, and then there's the actual name of the drug, and then they come up with the commercial name for it, and it's like, okay, and boy, they are really pushing it on people. If you watch, you know, the the nightly news or something, it's one med commercial after another. They must and, have a hell of a Scrabble game. These guys it must be. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And now we're noticing that the disclaimers and the the uh, and uh, adverse that. reaction stuff is like forty percent of the commercial. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, so the the law changed. I don't know. I don't remember when, but it used to be that all of that um, important safety information, or fair balance, the disclaimer stuff, was read really, really fast, and. You know, somebody in Washington said, this doesn't make any sense because nobody can understand it. So now that disclaimer information is not read quickly. And in fact, it's read um, in the same kind of almost conversational voice as the rest of the spot. They don't want it to really stick out. And it's read over people who are, you know, on screen. They're having a wonderful time and they're laughing and they're in a bathtub or they're at the beach and, you know, all the rest of these really beautiful things. So the, what you're seeing and what you're hearing are not really m matching up. Um, but that's that's the way they're that's the way yeah. it's done now. So, Deb, if someone wants to learn from you how to do this and enter this marketplace, because there seems to be plenty of work out there, how would they get in touch with you? At my website, DebbieIrwin.com, and there's a contact form there, and you can fill it out and let me know. I, you know, I ask you questions about your experience and uh, what areas you're interested in working in, and then I'll get in touch with you and schedule a free 20-minute chat and see, figure out if if it's a good fit uh, i'm not the right fit for every project or every person and i offer both private coaching and i'm also doing small groups now as well i have a couple of medical ones coming up in next month and the month after excellent well deb it is a pleasure to see you we don't get to see each other much during the pandemic but now we're running into each other in all sorts of places, which is great. Thanks for being on the show tonight, and we really appreciate your expertise in this, and I'm looking forward to having you on again when Thank we'll come you. up with something else to talk about. All right. There I must can, be something. <laughs> we always find something when we get together. Thanks anyway, so yeah. much. All right. Thanks for being with thanks, us. Thanks, Debbie. All righty. Well, George and I will be right back to wrap things up and re-rack it for Tech Talk right after these important messages. So. <laughs> 
Don't go away. <laughs> You're still watching VLBS? <laughs> Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. There's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products, and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. VoiceOver Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources, and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions, bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, home studio setup, and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Well, guess what? It's time to talk about a great new service from our friends at voiceactorwebsites.com, and it's called voiceactor.com. What is voiceactor.com? VoiceActor.com is a website that allows you to get your website up in a very short period of time. When we came up with this idea, Joe, Joe Davis and I were talking about it. He says, what do you want? What would be good for people in the voiceover business, especially people starting out? And I continue to say, and I keep saying this should be the tagline, your, home, your, your voiceover website should not be a pain in the ass. Uh, because back when it was always very difficult to, you'd have to hire a webmaster and you know, I want this content. I want that. I said, template it, make it easy. People can go in there. They can use a template. They can change the colors. They can add the pictures they want. And it's very user friendly and you can do it really, really fast and get yourself online very, very fast. And to get started with voiceactor.com, it's free. Uh, $20 a month will get you even more features with it. But if you need to get your website up now, that's the place to do it. Go over to voiceactor.com and get your website up and running right now. We are the World Voices Organization, also, also known, known as, as Wovo. We're the not-for-profit industry association of freelance voice talent. VoiceOver is a complex entrepreneurial business. Wovo is there to promote the professional nature of voice work to the public, to those already established in their voiceover practice, and to those who want to pursue voiceover as a career. Membership benefits include a supportive and creative community, community. a profile and demos on voiceover.biz, our searchable directory of vetted professional voice talent, our exclusive demo player for your personal website. Our mentoring program, business resources, and our video library. Our annual WovoCon conference, a fun and educational weekend with other members with, with the, the chance, chance to, to learn, learn and, and network. network. Webinars and great speakers and weekly social chats with other members around the world. If your world is voiceover, make Wovo part of it. World Voices Organization. We, we speak, speak for those who, who speak, speak for a living. living. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. And we're back with VoiceOver Body Shop. Uh, to wrap things up for this particular segment, our thanks again to Debbie Irwin for her expertise in medical narration. And it, it, it can be a lot of fun doing medical narration, especially when you get the weird words and the weird jobs. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see here. Next week on this very show... And we're about to do it live. If you happen to be watching live, you might want to stick around and ask your questions for Tech Talk. Um, not, otherwise, you're going to have to watch it in replay. But it's a lot more fun when you watch it live because we never know what's going to happen. Uh, so next week, we'll have Tech Talk number 104. And then on June 19th, Hugh Klitsky will be joining us to talk about getting your demos the way they should be. Uh, and he's an expert on demos, and he's a, a fun guy to talk to. Uh, let's see here. George the Tech, you got any specials for all the people going to your website? Uh, we just have the same coupon code I've been telling you guys about for quite a long time, and that is on our site at just put in V-O-B-S Fan 10 and get 10% off on anything that you buy or do through georgethe.tech. All righty. 
Uh, here are our donors of the week. We got a couple of new ones. So we'll start off with Grace Newton, Christopher Epperson, Robert Leadham, Stephen Chandler, Casey Clack, Jonathan Grant, Thomas Pinto, Greg Thomas, A Doctor Voice, Antland Productions, Martha Kahn, 949 Designs, Sarah Borges, Philip Sapir, Brian Page, Patty Gibbons, Rob Ryder, Shauna Pennington Baird, Don Griffith, Trey Mosley, Diana Birdsall, Maria Mackis, and Sandra Manwiller. All righty, thanks. You can donate to the show if you go to our website, if you're already there, uh, vobs.tv. There's a little button there that says Donate Now, and you can give us a dollar a month, $10 a month. You can give us your entire life savings, and we will not complain. <laughs> anyway, uh, but that helps us keep this show going and technically fantastic. Uh, the other people helping us out are our sponsors, like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActor.com. And, and WorldVoices.org, the Industry Association of Freelance Voice Talent. Join today because we get lots of cool stuff going on there. Our thanks to Jeff Holman in the chat room getting all those questions to us uh, from Facebook and YouTube and all that stuff. Yep. Sue Merlino, who has to leave us for whatever reason, so George and I get to control everything for the next hour, uh, for getting the things done on the technical end, and, of course, Lee Penny just for being Lee Penny. Well, this is not an easy business, but there's so much to it, and that's why we bring you people like Deb Irwin and all the other great guests we have to tell you how to succeed in this business with lots of trying. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO BS. Yes. Stay tuned for Tech Talk. We'll be right back. Where'd you get that one from?